Hello, everyone. Welcome to Improvate's Defense and Cyber Conference. Israel is well known throughout the world as a pioneer in defense technologies. We are proud to present solutions that we know can improve the security of free nations. We established Improvate as a platform for cooperation and business development. And in light of the situation in Ukraine, today's event will facilitate connections between Israeli defense and cyber companies, as well as military and defense ministry representatives from throughout the region. Gary Kasparov came to international fame at the age of 22 as the youngest world chess champion in history. He is the chairman of the New York-based Human Rights Foundation, ambassador of the Avast software for which he discusses cybersecurity and the digital future, and is on the executive board of the Foundation for Responsible Robotics. In 2017, he founded the Renew Democracy Initiative dedicated to promoting the principles of the free world. Mr. Kasparov has repeatedly warned the world of the dangers of authoritarianism and is the author of Winter is Coming, Why Vladimir Putin and the Enemies of the Free World Must Be Stopped. I'm very pleased now to welcome our keynote speaker to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great pleasure being here. So, and, uh, um, okay. The title of my speech, so it's the cyber war in war, because we have now both the real war, the tragic events in Ukraine, uh, and, um, and the cyber war, which has just uh, preceded this war, and also in the perimeter of the war. And uh, the title very much you know, reflects my understanding of, uh, of the game algorithm. Offense is the only defense. I thought whether to say the best but I ended up with saying the only, because you know, my presentation probably can convince you, and I'm not sure I should convince you, because you're a real expert, unlike myself in, in cybersecurity, but I know something about psychology of the game and, and, and uh, war games and how we can handle it. So um, let me start with just, you know, with, um, though I was introduced very briefly, just as, as the former chess prodigy and world champion, but still that I, I wanted to bring a couple of you know, um, uh, visuals that to show my shift from um, being a chess hero to, um, to uh, one of the most uh, prominent um, opponents of Putin's uh, dictatorship. So the one is there to me. Uh, look at this hair, huh? <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's, you can guess, it's 1985, so I just came from Moscow back to Baku, my, my native town, so fresh as the youngest world champion in history, and you see the big crowd surrounding me, so it's the yeah, great moment, great moment. Uh, so um, that's another one that's also surrounded, not by admirers, but it's Putin's police. That's exactly the day I can tell you. I'm not sure about the first one because it's just from November, but not sure about it. This one I know for sure. It's, it's August 17, 2012. Uh, I just uh, came back from my um, vacations and uh, I rushed to... Um, to one of the uh, local courthouses where they had the verdict of pussy riots. And um, you know, I ended up being arrested. Um, so it was not just an arrest because it could end up very poorly to me since you know, after having this brawl with the, with the uh, riot police, um, so they uh, accused me of biting a, a, a police officer, a sergeant. Um, yeah, by the way, it, it was quite serious because by, by Putin's laws, you know, so attack, on, on, on an official uh, who was, you know, just, it's, uh, just during his, uh, his service, uh, uh, could, could be up to five years in prison. Oh, at that time, 10 years ago, you know, you still could present some video, uh, um, video um, evidence in the court. Actually, you can actually see that this is the alleged bite is already, this already this, this, the, the scarf on, on the hand of this officer. But uh, a part of being, you know, terrified by the threat of being you know, just, just thrown in jail, I was also insulted because, you know, as a world champion, I would never bite anybody below the rank of major general. <laughs> so that's the, uh, that's this, this, this event, uh, it's played an important role in my decision to actually emigrate 
uh, um, from Russia uh, a few months later. So it's uh, since 2013, February 2013, so I um, live in exile in, in New York. Um, so now, as we talk about the war today, so it's, we often hear, wow, who, who could have imagined that? Really? So in the next few minutes, I can try to uh, present you the evidence why the war was imminent. And I've been talking about it for quite a while, for really quite, quite a while, uh, for a simple reason, you know, because uh, I've been listening to Vladimir Putin. I, I don't pretend to be Nostradamus. I don't have a crystal ball. You know, I don't make any guesses. I just, you know, listened to a former KGB um, lieutenant colonel. Uh, and according to, his, in, to, his, to um, his own words, there were no former KGB agents. And when I heard Putin addressing his uh, quote-unquote former colleagues, still being a prime minister at, at uh, KGB headquarters in Lubyanka, um, so, and saying these words, so I already knew that Russian fragile democracy was in, 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 in great danger. And uh, um, my first article about Vladimir Putin and the potential threat of his regime dated by January 4, 2001. I'm not, you know, just um, Monday morning quarterback, so I um, wrote about it. Yeah, it's, uh, it was the beginning, so I didn't know what would come next, but I warned about potential dangers coming from this man who was not shy, saying the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. So when you hear a former KGB, quote, unquote, former KGB agent, talking about collapse of the Soviet Union being a big tragedy, and also uh, uh, as a first act as a president of Russia, returning Soviet anthem, you can put one and one together, actually one plus one plus one, and uh, end up with a conclusion that if given the chance, he could try to implement his program, if given the chance. And um, he was given the chance. So, um, and it's not that, you know, he has been preparing for his assault uh, in the darkness. He was not even hiding. He did everything in front of the whole world. And as many dictators in the past, he even warned us about his plans. It's kind of a paradox, isn't it? Dictators, they always lie about what they have done. But very often, they tell us exactly what they're going to do. I mean, Hitler's Mein Kampf was written in 1924, published in 1925. But people didn't take it seriously. And I understand, who, who was Hitler in, 2000, in, in 1925? A, a, a leader of a small nationalistic party that was far from, from, from power in Germany, and no one could have, could have imagined they would ever you know, uh, take, uh, uh, be, go that far. Vladimir Putin, when he talked about these things, he was already president of Russia. And in 2007, in Munich, 15 years ago, in Munich at security conference, he bluntly taught, uh, told the leaders of the free world that it was time to go back to the 1997 borders of NATO. And just to uh, eliminate any doubts, next year he attacked the Republic of Georgia. Uh, that was you know, one of the potential candidates to, to, to join NATO. Oh, I heard Ward saying, no, no, it was not Putin, it was Medvedev, and some people remember the name of this drunk, you know, this lousy drunk, uh, who sometimes appears now on social media. Um, and, uh, um, and in 2014, he annexed Crimea. Still, you know, even after that, you know, action, so there was still, you know, he, was all, he was always given a benefit of doubt. From 2014 to 2022, Russian propaganda 24-7 talked about Ukraine being um, not a real state, a failed state. They openly told about plans to, to finish, finish the job off. Again, uh, not a big yawn, but very little attention has been paid to words, preparation, and actions. Now, when people talk about you know, this, this, the evidence, so I'm saying, uh, what kind of evidence you know, um, uh, could convince people who used to operate with numbers? The budget. People could talk about, uh, uh, I mean, they, they, it could be a bravada, and they could brag about you know, the big Napoleonic plans, but the budget is a clear indication what they want to do. Let's look at the Russian budget. 
So what else do you need? And by the way, what do you buy if you prepare for war, for war and for sanctions? You buy gold. Those are the numbers that could prove to anyone that you know, military, police, propaganda, and gold. Year after year, Putin kept investing in, this, in these uh, uh, areas. And uh, Russia spent, in, within 10 years, something like $820 billion on its military. Thanks God, it's corruption. They probably stole two thirds of that. But still, you know, this is the, the indications were all there. And, and they kept repeating that, you know, they would finish Ukraine off. So the, it was not a war that's about to uh, give Putin a better bargaining position. It was a war to eliminate Ukraine as an obstacle uh, on Putin's plans to um, uh, become all powerful uh, European leader. And also to win this geopolitical battle against, against uh, uh, NATO. Putin and his cronies repeated that they wanted to take revenge for the loss of the Cold War, World War III. And knowing that they were much weaker in conventional forces, they still relied on political will. Because we have political will and the free world didn't. So that's, uh, that's what's, what's, what, what's happened uh, uh, in, in, in February when they just crossed uh, the demarcation line and, and decided to take over Ukraine in, as they expected in 96 hours. Uh, by the way, the free world shared the same, the same um, mm, calculations. It's quite amazing that American intelligence that spectacularly failed in Afghanistan, thinking that they could hold it and lost it in four days, made the opposite mistake in Ukraine, thinking it would be lost in four days, but it's, it's still there. Yeah. Um, and uh, also, when you look at the Pentagon, uh, the General Milley, uh, testifying uh, on the Hill on February 2nd and February 3rd, um, uh, talked, ag uh, basically made an argument against supporting Ukraine with, with modern weapons because the Ukrainian army would not survive for more than a week. So the consensus of American intelligence and, and military was that Ukraine was, was dead meat. Okay, they were wrong. So it's the, thanks God. But of course, you know, we, we are seeing that Ukraine paying in blood the huge price for these, um, for these um, mis, uh, mis, mis, uh, miscalculations. And uh, um, of course, this war, since we're talking, we're here on cybersecurity conference, uh, this war uh, 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 has been preceded by the cyber attacks. And we can go all the way back to, to um, uh, the dates uh, when, when Putin prepared his uh, um, um, uh, campaign in Europe because it was a hybrid war. And, uh, and one, the first attack was um, uh, in, in 2007 uh, against Estonia after Estonia decided to remove Russian um, uh, um, um, Soviet monuments. Yeah, Soviet monuments. Um, and uh, actually it's, not, it's moved from one place to another. Uh, and it was first try. For a couple of days, they paralyzed Estonian, Estonian state agencies because Estonia was, you know, it's had so many functions, state, state functions on, 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 on digital. Um, and again, uh, the response was meek, not, you know, as strong as one could expect. But Putin's preparation, you know, for the war, it's, it's actually even started in, in Russia in 2004, 2005. Um, they decided not to follow Chinese example to build a firewall and just to block internet, but to do something, to do the opposite, to flood internet with data. So they already created troll factories and um, uh, uh, fake news industries, testing them on Russian opposition. And, uh, and I have to say that, you know, it was quite amazing to actually see how they could compose the entire, you know, uh, arguments on one page. And then you just don't understand it's, it's, it's the same trolls. It's not simply saying Gary Kasparov is the enemy of, 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 uh, of the state or it's a bad guy. It's somebody saying, yes, he is a traitor. Somebody else comes, it comes um, joins, saying, no, 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 he's a great player. You know, he's, he, you know, he did so much for our country. And then the third one comes, yes, but he should stay playing chess. And the whole you know, page, pages, could be constructed. Um, so Americans experienced the same in 10 years where, you know, that's just, there's so many MAGA accounts have been directly linked to, uh, to uh, Russian, Russian trolls. But before they attacked America, they had 10 years of experience how to play with this. And again, they have been preparing it in just in, you know, in, in, in the opening space. Again, not hiding their intentions, simply building it, 
block by block and moving from Russian opposition to Russian to Russian speaking neighboring countries and then to Eastern Europe and then further uh, further uh, uh, west so um, um, and uh, and now we have this the uh, the uh, um, the headlines about uh, Russia's Russia's um, um, uh, cyber cyber attacks, and um, that's you know actually it's a main point of my presentation today. Um, everybody expected that you know Russia would not simply crush Ukraine on the battlefield and would take over Kiev and other major cities, but obviously Ukraine would be destroyed in cyber war. Ukrainian infrastructure will be totally paralyzed, and Russian cyber attacks will, you know, will um, wipe out any, any organized resistance in, in, in Ukraine. That's what that's was expected based on, on the very um, mm, cautious response by Americans and Europeans on similar attacks on their infrastructure. Um, and uh, many times we heard that, you know, uh, it's, uh, dealing with, with this kind of threat, you know, we have to be very cautious because, you know, if you, you do something aggressive, you know, it, it could be an avalanche of, of um, uh, attacks that could totally ruin your, your country, your critical infrastructure, since, you know, there's so many things are, you know, uh, related to, to, um, uh, to uh, internet and we just we can't afford it. I don't know why, but Ukrainians didn't care about this kind of warnings. And uh, uh, what's happened there, it's the first time, first time, Putin and his hacking machine tested their own medicine. Uh, Ukrainians decided that's the best, uh, actually the only defense is offense. And uh, while we still don't know all the details, or just definitely it's too early to talk about them, I'm sure there will be books written about it, but the first time since uh, the beginning of Putin's hacking operations and uh, his uh, attacks on um, attacks on on critical infrastructure on uh, in other countries, so uh, they were attacks that uh, pushed Russians to relocate the resources to defend their infrastructure. So I don't know whether you followed. I'm sure you know. It's, this is your expertise. So how many Russian institutions have been hacked? in the first few weeks of the war, from Gazprom to, to, to media resources, to the banks, so all over the place. So from serious attacks that could actually steal, steal the data, and we're talking about very sensitive data, to you know, little you know, um, hacking exercises as putting Ukrainian anthem on one of the Russian, uh, Russian uh, radio stations as, instead of Russian anthem. So um, it was a very important um, moment because actually we saw how things could, you know, could be influenced. And, uh, and uh, um, um, uh, Ukrainians, Ukrainians, they just realized that you, know, it's the, the, you have to keep them busy. So uh, you have to keep them busy. And, uh, and uh, it was a great combination of, of the heroic resistance on the ground, but also, also very skillful, very skillful attacks on the net. So um, uh, all of a sudden, great resources, both you know, material and human resources, on the Russian side, they had to be relocated, re uh, 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 redirected to, to protect Russian infrastructure because it's, you know, it proved to be very painful. Uh, and, uh, and I have to say that you know, at this stage, you know, Ukraine succeeded in, in minimizing the damage. While everybody expected you know, something really bad, and I, I was asked by Europeans, oh, what's, what would be the outcome? So if they go after us, I said, don't go worry, you know, your croissant, well, in France, your croissant will be warm in the morning for a simple reason, Ukraine is fighting. Yeah, just, you, should not, you should not be uh, so, so paranoid about uh, a threat coming from Russia because they're busy. They're busy both fighting in, in the fields of Ukraine, but also in, 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 in the cyberspace. Um, uh, what Ukrainians found out that is that you know, every attack you know, um, needed a plan, so this, they, they had to prepare, and, uh, and they kept them busy. They kept them busy with, with, with attacks here and there. Again, it's a long list of attacks. I mean, we don't know who exactly attacked this Russian critical infrastructure. Hackers, you know, it's anonymous groups in the world, but the fact is that 
you know, at the beginning of the war with Ukraine, Russia first time experienced massive attacks on all fronts and basically it paralyzed uh, um, its, its attacking, attacking uh, capabilities. Um, um, and uh, uh, so, um, and uh, um, I think it's just, you know, it's the, while we're talking about this war now, it's very, you know, I think we have to just recognize that cyber war cannot be separated from, from the war on the ground because it's part of the, of the war now and, and uh, so many lines are being crossed. You know, as one of the advantages of Ukraine is this, is this more effective use of the, of the technology. But, you know, but even Russians now just, you know, facing uh, Ukrainian drones now had to buy Iranian drones. Yes, that's the, also by the way, tells you something about the advanced technology in Putin's Russia. I think it's, it's overall, I think we have to recognize that, you know, that's the, the myth about the um, greatness of dictatorships. Dictatorships, they can mobilize resources, they can win wars. No, they need still need technology. You know, even, even the Soviet Union in World War II would not survive for too long unless there would be American land lease that was absolutely crucial in the first two years of war that, that helped them to survive when the industry was crushed. Um, and, uh, um, and it's now the um, war in Ukraine, both online and offline, demonstrates the advantages of, of uh, the free world. Um, first, you know, you have technology, you have satellite, you have other things, you know, that, that, that will be connected. Uh, then you have the hardware, because uh, uh, even, even, uh, the, um, uh, even American HIMARS without, you know, long-range missiles, they still, you know, uh, can shoot much further than, 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 than uh, uh, Russian guns. Um, uh, and also, it's about creativity. This is something that is so important in, 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 in a modern war, um, as, in, as in businesses, is an, your ability to think creatively and, and respond quickly. Um, one, of the, one of the things that helped Ukrainians in the, in the beginning of the war, you know, in, in the battle for Kyiv, is their ability to use uh, uh, mobile, mobile units. While Russian army, well, traditionally, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's well organized, but it's, it's, it's a vertical. So you wait for instructions, and basically Ukrainians realized you know, you hit a tank with a commander and the whole battalion is, is, is stalled. So while uh, Ukrainians demonstrated that they could actually maneuver uh, and outmaneuver Russians by using these mobile, uh, mobile, mobile units. So on, on, on cyber, it's, it, it's, this advantage is even, 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 even more, more important. So, and, uh, um, and I think it's just, it's now, it's, um, it's time to get, actually to see that the, um, uh, um, we, um, we have to combine these, these efforts. It's, the, it's military, it's, it's cyber, but it's also economic. It's also economic, so that's why here I mentioned you know, that, that Liz Truss, that's a new, uh, new prime minister of Great Britain, so she's talking now about the very next important step. So it's not just about freezing assets of Russian oligarchs and, 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 and Putin's mafia, but also seizing them. So it's a, it's a big step. We all understand that we're dealing you know, with many, um, legal uncertainties. But it's a war, and it's not just a war, there are war crimes and genocide. And hopefully, you know, this, this, these two factors could, could contribute to, to the decisions that, that we all are, are, are waiting for. So I think it's just, it's the, the war definitely provides us a lot of, you know, um, information to understand how things will develop. And, uh, um, and we actually move from many hypothetical discussions, what if, into the territory where just we need actions to be taken now, and uh, that's why conference like this one, it's, it, it, it's so important. Yeah, and also we understand that unless Putin is stopped uh, in Ukraine, unless his arm is being defeated, that's not the end of the story. So um, uh, slowly, slowly the leaders of the free world realize that uh, Putin's appetite would not be satisfied by Ukraine. And uh, uh, now uh, they still have a luxury I'm not happy with the word luxury when we talk about the war, but still luxury from their political perspectives to give Ukraine's weapons and Ukrainian soldiers to use them most effectively to stop Russian, uh, Russian invasion rather than sending NATO, NATO uh, soldiers to, to um, fight and die. So um, it's again, it's this war, I have no doubt, this war uh, would become one of the turning points in history. So uh, there's so many th lessons from the war, and uh, also, again, it's um, reminded us about um, uh, the ability of the free people to meet all the challenges. 
And I think it's uh, one, of the, one of the important things is to, um, it's a wake up or even just, you know, it's the, it's the end of the illusions of many young people in the free world, in America or in, in Europe, that uh, capitalism and, and liberal democracy are not necessary pillars for our success. Oh, uh, look at China. Yeah, I look at China. China gave us virus, America gave us a vaccine. That's very simple. Yeah, and, uh, and, uh, and Ukraine also, Ukrainian, Ukrainian heroic resistance and eventual victory, it's something that sends the message around the world. It's not just about preserving Ukrainian territorial integrity, because I believe that the war will end with Ukrainian uh, uh, liberating their country, uh, including Sevastopol and Crimea, and that will be the beginning of liberating of, of Russia from Putin's fascism. But it also sends messages everywhere. I think that Taiwan is safe now, because China, Xi Jinping scratch their head and think, okay, maybe we should, we should wait. I think it will send messages to everywhere, to Syria, to Venezuela. Uh, so every dictator in the world, you know, now is thinking so uh, whether we should uh, move or wait. And, and uh, um, Ukraine, I think, will change the global balance of, of authoritarian forces versus um, uh, forces of democracy. Um, and uh, um, it's, you know, it's now a front line of the never-ending battle between tyranny and, and freedom. And that's why, again, I am so, so now happy to see that, you know, uh, the free world is gradually coming together to uh, take the side. As Rina Nevelin said, it's time to take sides. And, um, and just going back to my original occupation, so when people criticize me saying, oh, in politics, everything is gray, not black and white, this is black and white. It's as simple as chess. So you play the black or white, and I think you know we all know on, on, on which side we are fighting for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.